we're here at discipleship.org. Uh, my name is Matt Dabbs, and I'm with Steve McCoy, and he is the founder and the lead pastor of the 360 Church in Sarasota, uh, also the developer of the uh, Small Circle app, which I have on my phone. It's a phenomenal app, and also speaker and author and all-around good guy. We're going to be talking about discipleship, of course, on this this recording, and I'm thrilled to just talk to Steve. I really respect him a great deal, and I'm look, looking forward to uh, hearing what he's going to kind of share with us. So, so welcome, Steve. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate discipleship.org and always the, the open door to have conversations. So absolutely appreciate all that. Well, our first topic is talking about, you know, wired to go beyond the group setting. So can you talk to us some about that? Cause a lot of churches have groups got like the big thing and then like smaller groups and you're saying like even smaller. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, when we, when I speak to pastors, leaders, when we do trainings, I always like to emphasize that, you know, the obvious fact is that Jesus had, was involved in all those dynamics. So this is, when we talk about one-to-one -one disciple making, it is never an instead of mode. It's really in infusion with, with groups. And I think when you look at the ministry of Jesus, we think in terms of circles, of course, that's where small circle gets its name, but we have a big circle with crowds, typically, you know, equating to our corporate worship and our church culture. We have mid circle, which is groups of some kind. Sometimes those are home groups, Bible studies. Some people have classes, you know, in their churches. And both of those are beautifully distinctive as they were in Jesus's ministry. But when you look closely at, at Jesus's approach, he often had these one-offs and those, uh, you know, whether it was with the woman at the well, Martha in the kitchen, Nicodemus at night, Zacchaeus over coffee and falafel or whatever they were having. <laughs> and, and it's, I think sometimes we overlook the value of that dynamic. And so we often look at why is this? And so Jesus is proving to us that he had many levels of relationships, many different kinds of relationships. And so even with his, you know, the core of 12, of course, he had a micro group within the group with Peter, James, and John. But then we, you look at the relationship that he had with John and it's such a unique relationship. And I just, there are things that just keep unfolding for me in that relationship that Jesus had with John. Of course, he was his gospel is different than the synoptic gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in a variety of ways. He doesn't begin with a genealogy. Of course, Mark doesn't either, but he begins in a, an eternal sense, you know, in the beginning was the word and he gives us the names of Jesus that are unique to his gospel, the bread of life, a good shepherd, living water. Those are unique to John's gospel. Of course, historically, we believe that John was the only one not martyred. John, of course, was given the gift to uh, experience the book of Revelation and record it. Uh, of course, at the, at the, um, you know, the uh, crucifixion, all the disciples had scattered. Only John came back. Um, when Jesus gave the care of his mother to John, it was unusual culturally. He should have given that, the care of his mom to one of his half brothers, but it was, it just kind of highlights that relationship that he had. But one of the things that's super interesting to me, and it's, it's, you know, sometimes there are those in between the line things that we see in the Bible and the gospel, but with, I just find it interesting when John writes about the last supper and, and John 13, of course, in the other gospels, when Jesus reveals that he's going, that someone's going to be a traitor and betray him in the other gospels, they're asking, is it me? John doesn't ask that question. He knows it's not him. But Peter, of course, being the amplified voice in the crowd, the guy that, you know, whipped the sword out in the garden, chopped the, the soldier's ear off, it would have been natural for him when Jesus, you know, broke that news that someone was going to betray him. It would have been natural for Peter to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, who are we talking about? And kind of blurt something out. And yet there's an indicator that even Peter knew John's got this special relationship. Of course, John referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Jesus loved all the disciples, but there's a distinction uh, in, in, in a sense that they, that David, Jonathan kind of relationship and, and Peter leans over to John and said, ask him who it is. 
And so it's just a, it's kind of a neat moment. Even in John 21, when Jesus, you know, is asking Peter, will you love me more than these? And then he reveals the kind of death that Peter's going to experience. It's interesting that Peter didn't say, well, how about the other guys? And he was like, well, how about John? How's, how's he going to die? So when you begin to read, you know, between the lines there, I just think it's fascinating that Jesus, the son of God is telling us that all kinds of relationships are important. The group relationship is important. The micro group relationship, those three or four close friends and, and, uh, people, family, maybe that really know us well. But then I would say everybody needs that David, John, Jonathan, Jesus, John, Paul, Timothy relationship. And we've just found great value and, uh, to to your opening, we find that there's some fascinating things that we're actually wired, that God made us in a way that not, and again, instead of a group, but to get beyond that group and to find that kind of David Jonathan relationship. So you're, when you're talking about the one-on-one, -on -one, it feels like as a good American over here in Auburn, Alabama, <laughs> that, you know, that sounds really slow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound pragmatic. It doesn't sound efficient, you know, like I'm going, cause, cause here in America, we want success and we want it fast. And so, you know, this, but really what you're saying is that, oh yeah, there, well, there's never a guarantee of success in anything that we do, but to go deep is to go intimate. And that's where real transformation can really take place with people that may not take place on a level of 20, 30, 40, even five or six or seven. I can sit in a group of five men and still not want to say certain things, you know? But if I'm with that one person who's like, man, I, I know I could, this is safe. Like there's a different level of conversation there that is just so essential that we, uh, what's the percentage of Christians don't have that? I mean, or don't practice it probably 99%. It is. It's such a good point, Matt, because, you know, we, when you look at history and you kind of pull back, even in American history, if you want to limit it to, to, you know, just our, our environment. We are downstream of the industrial revolution. And so it used to be, of course, before the industrial revolution, which then gave birth to cities and gave birth to, you know, labor and child labor and all those things. But before that, you know, families kind of worked together. They stuck together. The, you know, the children were working alongside the dad and the mom. And so something happened in that process that bigger and faster and more quantity became a measure of success. So of course, when Henry Ford came along and, you know, we give him credit for the automobile, but probably equal to that achievement was the assembly line. And so we, that has trickled down into, instead of mom and pop hardware stores, we have you know, big box stores, we have the Home Depots and the Walmarts of the world. And as much of a value of that can be, and as far as pricing, sometimes I think we would all agree that we've lost the, va the depth of the watchmaker store of the shoemaker store and, and inwardly intrinsically because of the way that God has created us, we have, we long for that. And there's something in us that says, Matt, there's got to be something deeper. So mm. the way I look at it, it's in terms of the industrial revolutionary mindset, disciple making is farming. It's not a factory. Mm. And I think in our church culture, we've had to, I think we have to look at ourselves. And I think, you know, again, with discipleship.org, just kind of bringing this conversation over the, over the past, you know, years to the forefront to say, Hey, the factory is not producing the depth of life change and relationship that Jesus intended for us to have. And so when we think about one-to-one -one discipleship, our tools intentionally, if done the way we prescribe them to be done intentionally, you can't get through our tools any quicker than a, about a year and three months. Because we we find that over the years of doing this, we've been doing this probably 15 plus years, we find that there's something that happens. It's almost hard to put words on it, but something happens around the six month mark. It's not a science, could take five months, could take eight months, but 
we're building that bridge of trust and it takes time and our tools, the way that we've kind of fashioned the tools is that we have what we call labs and those labs are uh, chiseling what I call the wall of Adam, because the first thing that Adam did when he sinned was he hid. And when God came in the garden, of course, he's hiding from God. And we still have inherited that nature to hide, not only from God, but each other. That's why social media is so popular. We promote our, our best side and we protect our worst side. And until we get past that level, can it happen in a group? Absolutely. It takes, you know, it takes a talented group leader, I think, to navigate to that place, but it almost inevitably happens. And the smaller we can get, whether that's a micro group or one-to-one, -one, it, it just has a, it's a bit more of an incubator that seems nat more natural to get down to that level. And when we do, the results are just phenomenal. I've been in a, so our church has all three circles and we have, we have a few several worship services. We got 35, 40 different groups in our church. And we have, you know, a bunch of people that are doing one-to-one. -one. And I've been in a men's group for probably seven, eight years, same men's group. We have, we're always doing something fun together. We play, like tomorrow we meet, we play pickleball. After pickleball, we'll, you know, have a conversation, do some study together. But after being a Christian for 40 years, there's still some things that I'm not going to talk about in that group setting. That's me. I'm an introvert. And, you know, some people are more open with those things, but I've discipled three or four men one-to-one -one at different times in our group. And I will tell you the conversations are extremely different at that level than they are in a group. And so the beauty of it is mm -hmm. into having both, you know, we have great community in our group. We have great conversations in our group, but they are definitely different when you mm -hmm. get that smaller level. Oh. You, know, you mentioned Henry Ford, and I think that's a really great analogy between the factory and the farm. And it is the factory producing the results that are in line with the kingdom and, you know, how fruitful is that as opposed to the farm where it's family and you're shoulder to shoulder with close people and that sort of thing. You know, one thing that Henry Ford did also was he invented the five day, 40 hour work week. Mm -hmm. And he right. did that to give people leisure time to spend all that money they're making over in the factory. It's interesting. <laughs> and so he, he created in a sense, the consumer culture, not only the industrial assembly line side, but the consumer mindset culture also kind of came from Henry Ford through giving people leisure. How are they going to spend all this money? We're going to make our money back. Like, we need to get that money back from them by us, you know, selling it on like, main street. Right. You know? <laughs> and so, but that's true in our churches too, is that. It's that consumer, it's what I was saying a while ago. Is this efficient? Is it effective? How, how expedient is it? How fast is it going to move? You're like, yeah, a year in three months. Well, you know, but man, but that's how you get there. Yeah. You're going to have to, you're going to have to drill down and deeper is, is slower. You know, yeah, we've, we've proven that, you know, injecting steroids into our chickens didn't turn out to be that great of idea to make them faster and, you know, to make them bigger, faster or genetically modify our, our produce. And I think the same thing holds true. We would love that, you know, if we, if the, it was a reality that we could somehow genetically modify relationships, they don't work that way. We mm. can't inject our programmatic steroids mm. into relationships and have and expect results. It really is planting. It's waiting. It's watering. It's waiting. It's seeing, you know, you know, it's weeding, it's waiting. And so that, that is just the natural process, just like Jesus, you know, discipleship.org says all the time, Jesus style discipleship. Well, Jesus style discipleship was not a, you know, a weekend seminar. It was, you know, years in the making and, uh, you know, 24 seven with these guys. It takes a lot of intentionality, which is the forum in, in May of year 2024 is on intentionality and disciple making. You know, because, and I go back to the Willow Creek, the reveal study, you know, at Willow Creek that showed, hey, the more people got involved in the programs, the more they often struggled, you know, because they were just so overwhelmed with busyness. Mm -hmm. And so it, it goes back to saying, well, it's not necessarily that programs are a problem. It's how intentional are the programs in producing the kind of results that are aligned with kingdom values rather than, you know, we found a need and we're meeting a need. We had someone complain about something. So we started this. It's like, 
you know, it can be so unintentional about the programs. And, and there are some churches that are incredibly intentional about programs and do them extraordinarily well. And that makes a great supplement to what you're talking about, where these things coincide, but you have to be so intentional. It's such a good point, Matt. When we plant, so we planted our church about 16 years ago. And, and one of the lifelines I had was uh, Tom Rainer's book, Simple Church. And it just gave me the permission to say no and not to say yes. And I, I figured out as a church planner quite quick that it was a platform for many people that they uh, couldn't get their agenda accomplished somewhere else. And they brought it along. And there were many, you know, hey, we got to do this. We got to do this program. And when it comes to one-to-one -one disciple making, it's really interesting when you think about l that intentionality. If, you know, as we're, whoever's watching or listening to this, especially if you're a leader, a volunteer leader, a pastor, it doesn't matter. Just think about the intentionality of, of the upcoming weekend church service. So I, I just think of our own church. We have guest teams, we have safety teams, we have children's ministry that are, you know, they've been planning all week for. We have, you know, music, of course, worship ministry. Think they've been rehearsing. They've, you know, worked through the songs, the, the message for Sunday. There's been a lot of hours and events. So there's a lot of intentionality that goes into what we would call our big circle. There's a lot of intentionality that goes into our mid circle, into groups. So we have group leaders, we have group leader training, we have leadership, you know, pipelines, we have curriculum that we're planning. Group leaders are prepping for their groups. And then when it comes to this Paul Timothy relationship, we often just, man, let's, we hope that it will happen mm -hmm. and kind of organically. And I always say, you know, every church has a handful of Yodas that can just kind of do it. They're the, you know, they're the folks that can go to, you know, a coffee shop and say, Hey, how's your life going? And like, well, I'm kind of struggling with this. Well, let's go over here to Obadiah. And I'm like, wow. How do you do that? And so, you know, our press is that, how do we, is there a way that we can intentionally also navigate, help people navigate to this table for two dynamic? And so that's kind of the heartbeat of a small circle. So how do people navigate to that? I mean, so if someone's listening or watching this and they say, okay, well, my church doesn't have a program for one-on-one, -on -one, but I, I'm going to do it. Like, yeah. what would you say to them? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. I, so there's several ways that I, I would point them to our website, smallcircle.com. And the reason I would is that we, we have a whole video collection, almost a seminar in a, you know, in a box. And so there, every, w many years ago, I had a moment of conviction with God and he, it, it was, it was painful to be honest, because I was going to sell our tools and, you know, sell books mm -hmm. and nothing wrong with that. A lot of my friends and colleagues do, but God just had something different in mind, even at a global level, and just came to this point of conviction that we were to re-gift our tools to the world open-handedly. We just thought, hey, these are not ours, God, and that's what the direction. And so, you know, we have a lot of compassion for church plants. As a church planter, I know what it was like to not you know, get a salary for years and barely have enough to cut the lights on and get kids curriculum. So mm -hmm. we, we just as a kind of a disclaimer, you can go to our website. There's no premium version there. All of our tools are there for you for, you know, to be used. So there's a video collection, you go on the website and, uh, there's uh, free courses and that will really includes even things we're talking about today, kind of the why behind it. And it will also tell how to get started. But we, our champion is everyday people that we want to equip. So this is not, small circle is not about leaders discipling others only. Of course we need to, and we do, but it's really championing the, the everyday person, how to do it. So for that reason, we, for our tools, for every session, there's a disciple uh, making coach. And that code uh, and, and with, you know, built in within the tools and they, you can go on there and it's truly plug and play. So go on the website, you can, there's another button right above, you know, the fold and it says free, uh, free tools. And you click on that. You can get a PDF version that you can download. There are books that we sell at cost, but you don't need them, but I drive people to the mobile app. Uh, I mean, that's a whole different conversation for a different day, but 
There's some really neat features in the mobile app. And as Americans, sometimes we complicate things beyond, you know, what it needs to be. And when I'm in a training and I, and you know, there's a lot of, you know, questions, I I'll pull up a picture of, uh, you know, a village and somewhere in Asia or Africa and say, look guys, <laughs> it's plug and play. So it, if you, you download the app, you can go to the Apple store, you can go to Google play and, uh, you can download the app, small circle, one word, or you can get that link when you go to the website as well. But I think you'll find it really self-explanatory and, and there are tools for brand new believers. And then there's another called next, and then there's another tool called exchange for a deeper journey, but yeah, they're intended and designed not to be shallow at all, but to be accessible. And, uh, so yeah. it should be plug and play. That's awesome. So you're telling us how to get involved or how to get started. If someone's like, Hey, I, I feel convicted. I hear what you're saying. I've got somebody in mind, a neighbor, a friend, coworker, whatever. Let me start. Okay. There's the app. There's the web page. What words of advice or wisdom would you give them coming into that? If that's new for them, are there, what, what should they expect or what kind of things would you want to say to them? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Right before we jumped on together today, I just had a call, our Zoom call to um, Austria. And this lady had heard a podcast on discipleship.org and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and she is retired. She's a computer science major and she is using the app with her granddaughter and just thrilling. And so she asked a similar question like, Hey, and it was very touching. She looked straight in the camera and she said, do you think I can do this as a disciple maker? I'm like, oh my goodness, you got the hunger to pour into other people's lives. You've obviously got the humility to even ask that question. And, uh, you've got a rhythm with God. The answer is absolutely yes. It is not complicated when people. So as a disciple maker, let me take that one first. When you're in, when you're going to invest in another person, the mandate in the field manual in second Timothy two, two is simple and clear. You're looking to invest in an investor. So sometimes people will say, well, gosh, I know this guy, he hasn't been, you know, in rhythm with God for a long time. He hadn't been in church, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I'll disciple him. Hey, be his friend. Absolutely. Love him. Absolutely. But when you're investing, Paul said to Timothy, find faithful men and women. You're trying to find people that are in rhythm because they in turn are going to teach others. So what we often use the term culling Timothy's, we're calling them out. We're really trying to find those future investors. So my first, my first, you know, input would be that we're looking for as a disciple maker, choose carefully who you're going to invest in. Jesus invested in world changers. These, he knew these guys were ready to, you know, to go into all the world. We, we provide a disciple maker criteria for those that, you know, we use as a template. We say, Hey, modify it, use it, don't use it. It's up to you. But we do have a template that may be helpful. We're looking for people that have some rhythm with God that uh, are consistent in what they do so that we invest in those and, and the people investing. I would say in my opinion, Matt, and my observation, uh, uh, being in the ministry now for over 40 years. The number one reason that people don't disciple is that they feel inadequate. It's not disobedience. It's not belligerence, although I'm sure there's some measure of, of those things in certain people, but most people are like this, this gal I talked to in Austria, do you think I'm able to do it? And that is the most exciting thing that I experience when someone, an everyday person can pick up the tools and just move with it. My mom went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. She was 94 when she mm -hmm. passed. She was on her third disciple, one-to-one. -one. She was a Bible student like crazy, had Bible you know, classes, Bible groups that she taught, but she loved disciple making. And my mom was just an everyday person. And, uh, she was, when she passed, she was I just finished discipling an 80 year old. Wow. I think about that. Cool. A 94 year old 
discipling an 80 year old. And it's just evidence you can do it. <laughs> that's so cool. Well, that's really the perfect segue. We're going to actually have a second part here. That's going to talk about everyday people. And like what you said just primes that perfectly. I'm like, I want to hear more, like right. let's dive into that. And that'll be part two of this discussion. So are there any other words on, on this first part that, uh, you'd like to share before we wrap up? Yeah, just, to, I would say in closing, there is a fascination and maybe we'll talk a little bit about this, you know, expanded a little bit in the next session too, but it's really interesting when you begin to dive into that creation moment, when God said, let us make man in our image. And it's not, we're not just created in the image of God. We're created in the, our image of God. And God has built into us in every single individual, this yearning to have a relationship that is confidential, that is David, Jonathan. And yet at the same time, we're sometimes scared to death of it because of the Adam uh, syndrome that we deal with mm -hmm. and that hiding nature. And so my closing thought is fight it, you know, fight for it. Don't let Adam win and uh, just be comfortable in, you know, the larger crowds and uh, even the larger group setting, which are all wonderful, but fight to have that, that David, Jonathan, Jesus, John, Paul, Timothy relationship. And I think you'll see a new dimension of life change surface from that. That's so good. And, you know, and prayer being a part of that too, you know, asking God to send the right people to make it obvious to open hearts and to use us. And, and if you pray for God to send workers into the field enough, you're finally going to go, maybe I'm one of them, you know, totally. absolutely. So true, man. Yeah. Well, thank you, Steve. This has been yeah. a pleasure. Yeah. We're going to get part two rolling here in a minute that uh, if you're watching this or listening to this, make sure that uh, you follow up with that second part to get the rest of the conversation. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and I, I do want to mention the forum that's coming up in May, May the 1st and 2nd here in 2024, uh, where more resources like these are shared. And it's just a wonderful time around Disciple Makers. I know that's been uh, something that you've been a part of for some time also, Steve. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, for it, the forum in my mind is, of course, I'm biased, but the best, most valuable conference in the U.S. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, you're welcome.